All right. Here, I, I just want to restart this so that my timer is correct. All right. Seeing that. Okay. Um, so today, I want to tell you my humble little story. Uh, I guess this title is supposed to indicate the hope that I have that we will be successful, but uh, it's very hard to be sure. Um, and I hope you can be inspired by the lessons I've learned and the successes that I have had. So to get started, we've all heard and been inspired by uh, success stories. Tales of success are great, from Apollo 11 to Falcon Heavy, the original Macintosh to the iPhone. There's something very satisfying about when the odds seem stacked against us and yet we prevail. The problem with success stories is that they're exclusively told by those who have succeeded. And this is called survivorship bias. And it, this XKCD comic is great. It says, never stop buying lottery tickets. No matter what anyone tells you, I failed again and again, but I never gave up. I took extra jobs and poured the money into tickets, and here I am, proof that in the end it pays off. And I, I've heard a lot of uh, in, uh, inspiring talks that kind of follow this model, right? And I want to share my story precisely because it isn't a bona fide success story yet. I hope that uh, hearing my talk will help inspire you to try something that you've been wanting to try. So a little bit about me so you know where I'm coming from. I think of myself as quiet, straight-laced, financially conservative, and creative. I studied economics in college, but I've, always, but I've always worked as a programmer. I live in the suburbs of Phoenix, Arizona. This is what the weather's like out there today. And uh, with my wife and three children. I've been self-employed for the last two and a half years trying to make a living on the App Store. I have a friend and a business partner named Ron, who you'll see wearing a matching shirt. And, um, and we have some shirts if you want them. Uh, I, uh, anyway, uh, we've, been, we've worked on many projects over the past 12 years. But our most successful project so far has been, is, is an app called Skytripping. And let me show you what that is so you know about that. Skytripping is an app for iOS and Apple TV that features relaxing aerial films. Our customers use skytripping to combat stress, anxiety, depression, and addiction. They also entertain guests as well as just chill out to these beautiful videos. Um, if you want, if that looks interesting to you, it's a free download. But anyway, um, I'm going to tell you skytripping's origin story, the ups and downs of our journey. I'm going to tell you four drone crash stories and three bucket list items I've achieved. Uh, as well as the lessons we've learned along the way. And since my talk is called A Pre-Success Story, let's first define success. <clears throat> it has been said that success isn't the absence of failure, it's going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. For this talk, I want to keep things simple. The word success in this talk means business success. It means earning an income for my family while keeping my life in balance. So that's how I'm defining success here, and I, it's a narrow definition, and I hope you know that there's way more to life than success in business. So if you want to be successful like I do, it would make sense to know how people do it. What characteristics make people successful? Well, research has shows <coughs> that there is a particular characteristic that has emerged as a singular significant predictor of success. It isn't good looks. It isn't physical health, it isn't social intelligence or being a people person, and it isn't even IQ. And it's something that you've probably heard of called grit. Author Angela Duckworth defines grit as passion and perseverance for very long-term goals. Grit is having stamina. Grit is sticking to your future for years. Grit is living life like it's a marathon and not a sprint. So I really love this word but I find it problematic because when I hear the word grit, this is the image that pops into my head. And I don't consider myself one of these kinds of guys, one of these nose to the grindstone, overcome all obstacles kinds of guys. And so I wonder, 
can a guy like me be successful? Do I have grit? And, or, or can I learn grit? I really hope so, and the answer seems to be yes. So uh, grit you know, sounds really hardcore to me and intimidating, but it's a little more approachable when I break it down into some, compo some component parts. So here are four ingredients to grit. Now the first three, desire, effort, and determination, are pretty self-explanatory, right? You want something, you try for it, and you don't give up. That last ingredient is called growth mindset, and it probably needs some help. Uh, growth mindset is an idea from Carol Dweck from Stanford University. She says it's the belief that the ability to learn is not fixed but can change. It's an understanding that your abilities can grow. Any skill you don't have, you can have. Sometimes it feels convenient to disbelieve this, but if you want to succeed, you need to tell yourself that you can. So you see on this chart that Ron and I are somewhere in this tangled mess. And I think part of what I want you to come away with today is that this is not a bad place to be. I really am enjoying the path. It has disappointment and sacrifice and U-turns and dead ends and doubt, but it's definitely not bad. So far, my road to, self, uh, to successful self-employment has been a winding one, and I don't expect that to change. To tell you the origin story of sky tripping, I need to tell you about a, two other things that Ron and I built together that helped us arrive to where we are today. We'll start with something called Spoked in 2007. Then I'll talk about um, our first iOS app in 2014, and then finally sky tripping in 2016. We've tried many other projects as well, <laughs> but these seats are only so comfortable and I only have so much time. So the first thing Ron and I built together on our own was in 2007 called Spoked. And you're looking at that logo and you're loving it because you missed the Web 2.0 days. Why did we move away from rounded aerial with glassy overlays? I don't know. Beautiful. Anyway, Spoked was the service that lets families and friends keep in touch privately. And the business idea was simple. You see, in 2007, there's this company called Facebook. And we, we thought they might be evil. And uh, we thought that maybe people would want to come protect their privacy and communicate on a, on a safer place. But we were very wrong about that. Well, maybe half of that. Um, anyway, a handful of families, including my own, began using Spoked, but it was definitely not a financial success. So I, we kept it maintained for the next seven years. But through building this, Ron and I learned that we could work together and we could bring a project to completion. And that was an important lesson. Ever since the App Store launched, I wanted to make apps. I didn't really want to make money with apps. I just wanted to make an app. I wanted to have an app that I made on my phone. And I remember my wife bought me a book back then called Beginning iPhone Development. And I tried reading it, and I never got very far. I tried twice the excellent iTunes University Stanford classes, but I never stuck with them long enough. My relationship with iOS development remained unchanged for years. And as a Ruby developer, of course, I blamed Objective-C and those square brackets. But, but I know that wasn't the problem. In fact, I brought a picture of the problem. Obviously, thousands of people were writing and publishing apps, and I wasn't. I've had a good job and had time on the side to learn that I could have spent learning iOS development, but I didn't until I did. So buckle up for bucket list achievement story number one. So this is uh, to set the stage for this first app that we ever put on the App Store. It was January 2014, and life was different back then. There was no Apple Watch, no iPad Pro, no Apple Pencil. The biggest iPhone you could buy had a four-inch screen. Uh, in January of that year, nobody could stop singing Let It Go from Frozen. The ALS Ice Bucket Challenge hadn't happened yet, and there was a lot of press about a little game called Flappy Bird. And it was in the wake of this Flappy Bird craze that my business partner, Ron, talked me into building a game with him. But he didn't want to build just any game. He wanted to build an 8-bit style tapping game featuring a bird. I didn't want to build it. <laughs> I resisted because I didn't know how long it would take to learn how to do it. I didn't know for sure I could learn how to do it. 
I didn't have any reason to believe it would make any money, and I didn't want to spend time and energy on something that would never come to be or fail to be successful. I think I was even afraid of rejection from app review. This wasn't the first time Ron has come to me with an idea that I resisted, but this time something was different. I think I recognized the concerns I had as fears. And I, weigh, I was able to weigh them out with my desires. I knew I wanted an app, and I knew Ron would provide the artwork, the concept, and the push that would help me make progress. So I agreed to give it a try. I didn't quit my job. I didn't announce to the world that I was changing my life. I just decided to give iOS development another try. So it was called Bird Turd, and I was still too afraid to learn Objective-C. So for my fourth foray into iOS development, I, tried, I decided to try something called Ruby Motion. I'd never created a game before of any kind, and I, but I surprised myself with the help of Ruby Motion and Sprite Kit. I had a basic game working in a couple months, but there were some, some bugs that I couldn't seem to overcome. And before I was able to fix them, something interrupted us, and that something was an opportunity. In June of that year, a service similar to Spoked that was called MyFamily.com announced they were closing in the fall and deleting the data of hundreds of thousands of users. We put Bird Turd on the shelf and created a migration tool to move user data from MyFamily.com to Spoked. We called it Mayflower, and we also updated Spoked's logo and design. Migrating this data was messy work. Who here has uh, done screen scraping before? Yeah, a few hands, a few sad hands raised. Um, we, we had millions of pages of HTML that was designed in 1999. Lots and lots of nested tables, and it was, it was a, a summer of square pegs and round holes. I still had a full-time job, and I needed to stay on top of that work, too, so I had a lot of late nights. That summer was both thrilling and daunting. In the end, we moved about 2.8 million photos and over a billion words of families keeping in touch. There were pictures of people who had passed away 100 years ago, newborn babies, graduations, people's lives recorded in databases. It was very gratifying. Uh, we, we brought in about 100,000 users and about 2,000 paying customers, which translated to us each earning about $1,000 a month in residual income. So it's not enough for my financial goals, but it's, it was probably enough to start believing that it would be possible. Read that while I drink. <coughs> so that summer was crazy. Uh, we learned that inflexible deadlines and thousands of anxious people are very motivating. We learned that uh, doing a hard thing was very gratifying. And we learned how nice residual income was. <laughs> uh, that summer of craziness kicked up a bunch of dust and it took a while for things to settle down. But the next year, in the fall of 2015, I decided to get back to work on Bird Turd, and this time I ported it to Swift. And some of you are programmers, and you might want to know that that was a pretty simple uh, port, actually. If, like, I would copy, like, 10 lines of code and paste it into the Swift, about half of them were valid Swift already, so, because they're both very terse languages, it was kind of fun. Anyway, um, so porting it to Swift was pretty straightforward, but learning Xcode was not. Early in my experience, I read a statement on an Apple support doc that said Xcode saves you time. So whenever the IDE would crash, or misconfigure the certificates, or give unhelpful error messages, or not create a build after fixing a bug, I would repeat that mantra, Xcode saves you time. Eventually, I figured out Xcode well enough to submit it to the App Store for review. Clicking this button was really something. I didn't imagine it would feel like a big deal. It's just an HTML form. It's just the last step. And it might not technically be a big deal, but it represents a lot of time, work, and decisions. And that's why it feels the way it does. And if you've never clicked that button before and you've wanted to, I highly recommend it. Of course, eight days later, it was rejected. But it got approved that same day, so all is forgiven. This was my fifth attempt to create an iPhone app, and it was the first one that worked. So you remember my concerns. Well, I was right about it taking a lot of time, and I was right about our chances of making money. We made Bird Turd free and integrated with iAds and offered to remove them for a dollar in-app purchase. Over the next year, 
we were able to get 374 downloads and we made $3 in revenue. So that's $2.10 after Apple takes their cut. All right. Despite these pathetic numbers, I'm very glad Ron pushed us down this road. Because we grew. We could make a game. I could write some Swift. I could navigate Xcode, create builds, and submit to the App Store. I learned a little bit about recognizing fears and how healthy it is to, to stop and notice them. You shouldn't be afraid to look at yourself and recognize your fears. Fears are not bad. They can help keep you alive and keep you from overextending yourself. But you should ask yourself to make sure your fears are helping you and not standing in your way. OK, so a few months after Bird Turd was released, uh, we got tickets to the Apple TV Tech Talks in LA. The, the new Apple TV was announced, and we were excited about it. We made a road trip out of it, and he brought his DJI Phantom 3 Professional. We thought it'd be cool to film the wind turbines in Palm Springs and oil platforms in Santa Barbara, and maybe sell them as stock footage or, or see if we could meet somebody at Apple to partner with and like provide content for the aerial screensaver. Oh, you don't get audio? That's OK. Will it come through here? Oh, yeah. Do you hear it through the speakers? Awesome. The night before the tech talk started, we were both very tired in a hotel room in LA, watching the footage that we captured that day. And we were contemplating, how's the mix? Thumbs up? Bad? Anyway, um, I got no response. Good? OK. I should have looked at you. Um, so we put on some ocean sounds while we watched this film in reverse. And there seemed to be some magic in it. I was reacting to it in a very free way. I'm, like I said, I'm pretty reserved. But I was kind of giddy about it. And it was like trippy. And no, before you ask, no drugs were involved. The next day we attended the Tech Talks. And I can't remember mu mu much about what was uh, spoken. But I remember whispering with Ron about uh, and deciding what our app would be. And we reserved the name Sky Tripping in iTunes Connect. Uh, we were really excited about it. The job I had in, in December 2015 was going to evaporate at the end of the year. The startup had run out of money. I had some savings and some residual income from Spokes, so I wanted to try self-employment. And I thought, I will try it until the money runs out. I thought we could last about nine months if we were careful. It was very scary for me, but I wanted to give it a try. I was confident that I could get a job if I ran out of money. But it was still scary enough that we tightened up our belts and canceled every subscription service we could. Netflix, Hulu, Sparklets Water, Pest Control, Yard Maintenance. Dining out was out. Staying in was in. This is now the part of the talk where I make good on my promise to tell you the four drone crash stories. So I can't remember how Ron talked me into it, but we took cash from Spoke to inspire in, and bought this Inspire One from DJI. It cost about $5,000. And that was and is a lot of money to me. He passed down his Phantom 3 Pro to me and taught me to fly and film. Ron had traveled to the central coast of California and captured some great stuff on the Inspire, and I wanted to contribute. So one Monday afternoon, I packed my family in the car, and we took a two and a half hour drive to Sedona, Arizona. We hit some uh, road work related traffic, which set us back by an hour. So the sun was going down as I arrived, so I hurriedly got to flying. I flew west towards the sunset. Uh, with a silhouette of this very distinctive rock formation. It was topped by two spires, and it was really pretty. And I flew right between the two spires. And as you can see, it looked awesome. <laughs> and it looked awesome until it didn't look awesome, because I had lost my connection to the bird. Well, if it loses a connection, it should fly back to me, right? Maybe I can get to higher ground and reconnect. I'd lost connection before, but only, it only ever lasted for a second or two. Well, the, second, the seconds ticked on. I climbed 10 or 15 feet up the incline to my east, but I had a black screen. A man was nearby, photographing the sunset and smoking a cigarette. He calmly asks, did you lose a drone up there? It totally caught me off guard, uh, but it was great. His name was Dex. He's a professional photographer. He lives in Sedona. 
he tells me that that rock structure is called Cathedral Rock, and he thought we could probably recover the drone. He told me it was getting dark, the hike wouldn't be easy, there may be ice, and the shoes I had on were no good, but we could probably make it. Remember, this is at the end of my very first month of self-unemployment. The drone represented an investment of a little over $1,000. And I'm telling you this story, and I'm going to tell it in long form, <laughs> because I find it emblematic of me trying to be self-employed. There were no other people around where Dex and I were. The chances of us meeting and him being willing to help me filled me with hope. I told my wife to take the kids to dinner while Dex and I went to recover the drone. As Dex and I arrived at the trailhead, he asks me my shoe size. I answer and he shakes his head and smiles. He had an extra pair of hiking boots that he bought yesterday at the Goodwill. Everything was coming up Millhouse. So my wife is an actor and a film critic and a writer. And by the way, you should totally check out her podcast called Family Movie Night. But anyway, she taught me about this narrative device called The Hero's Journey. Many movies and stories use the hero's journey to tell a story, and this story of the drone recovery is no exception. So if you're not familiar with this, movies like Star Wars, The Matrix, The Lord of the Rings, The Hunger Games, they all follow these kinds of uh, elements. So I'm going to walk you through it really quick, and then we'll get to the story. So first we're introduced to the protagonist world, ordinary world. Um, then comes a call to action where a hero is compelled to go somewhere and do something. Sometimes they resist the call, but eventually they cross, cross the threshold into the unknown. A mentor helps and teaches our hero, and he or she faces tests and challenges. So you see it's going around in a circle. Um, oh, what happened? Oh, I must have pushed up. Thank you. All right, tests and challenges. Um, so they're, they're on their way to a reward, but um, oh, I'm all messed up. Okay, often there is an, a reward for overcoming the tests and challenges, but there's also a roadblock. This results in a nadir or a dark moment where the hero is tempted to give up. Often our hero is given supernatural powers or otherwise learns how he can face his nemesis in the final conflict. After the final conflict, our victorious hero returns home to his own world, now changed by the journey. So, in my story, my call to action is to rescue that drone. And we've, we've met my mentor, his name is Dex. Awesome guy. I crossed into the unknown by hopping into Dex's car and we arrived at the Cathedral Rock Trailhead, an unknown trail of unknown difficulty. And I faced tests and challenges. According to SedonaHikingTrails.com, Cathedral Rock is a short, seven-tenths of a mile, but strenuous trail, which ri quickly rises to 608 feet in elevation. The midsection of the trail has a near-vertical segment, which requires climbing. So that's about, what, 60 flights of stairs? And I hadn't exercised since high school. Uh, this hike was very difficult for me. I was very grateful every time we stopped for water. At the top of the trail, we looked for the drone. We didn't see it on the landing, we didn't see it on the hill behind, and we definitely didn't see it on the way up. And Dex turns to me and says, look, look up, there it is. <laughs> um, there, there it is. And, and it was right up there, high up on the rock face, its lights blinking down at us. And they seem to say, help me, help me. Dex says, get your remote out and see if it'll take off. I didn't have my remote. <laughs> I didn't think I'd need it. I thought we'd just pick it up off the ground. So Dex had gone on a hike earlier that day, and he didn't, have, he, he didn't have the energy to come down again with me, so he sent me on my own. So I was separated from my mentor. He had given me um, uh, the keys to his car and taught me how to wayfind using the cairns in the trail, the stacks of rocks. So I got down to the bottom of, of the the, the thing, the, the trail, but it disappeared on me and I couldn't find the car. So I was lost in the dark. My phone's battery was dead. My headlamp was not very bright. I was hungry, I was so tired, and my family didn't know where I was. 
I felt out of options. So I did what many people do when they feel like they're out of options. Now don't worry, this isn't gonna get very religious, but I did pray for help. And I didn't see a light, nobody came calling from the trees, I didn't hear any cars in the distance. But what I did get was a thought. You can figure this out. I would have preferred something better, but that's what I got. So I went back to where I lost the trail, and I determined the, trail, the direction the trail was heading. I knew that on this uh, topology, that it wouldn't make sense to, for the trail to change directions very much. So I figured if I kept going in the direction it was, the trail was heading, that I might run into either the parking lot or a, or a car. So I did. I left the marked trail in that direction. I crossed a dry riverbed where I had previously stopped, and I climbed up the bank on the other side, and there was Dex's Honda CRV waiting for me in the parking lot. I got in, plugged in my phone, I called Dex, I called my wife, and I found a miraculous Kit Kat in the crack between the seat and the center console. I rested a little bit while my phone charged, because I would need that to, to fly the drone. So now for the final conflict, the hike back up. Did I mention I was tired? My headlamp lit the way about 10 feet ahead of me, and I kept thinking, I don't know how much farther I can go, but I know I can get over this rock. And I don't know how much farther I have to go, but I know I can get to that tree. And just little by little, I made my way up. And I don't know of a time in my life where I've been so motivated and driven. And if it wasn't such a terrible situation, it would have been awesome. <laughs> So I got to the top of the hill, I assembled the remote, I initiated a takeoff, and it, it was an error. I tried again, error. I rebooted everything, tried again, error. I called Ron, who searched online with the error message, no help. I could do nothing but continue to try. The battery that was once at 20% was now at 1%. The red and, light, the red and green lights blinked on and off for another minute and then they stopped blinking. The drone was dead, stranded on a rock, 100 feet above us, in sight and out of reach. I returned home. I was not victorious in my quest. I had failed. Dex went up the next day and saw the drone was on its back, immobilized like a turtle. He went back the following day to try to knock it down with a slingshot, didn't work. The next day after that, he went up again and it was gone and I never found out what happened to it. I thought I would have recovered it. That's how the story seemed like it was supposed to end. But it didn't end that way. And it sucked. <laughs> the hero's journey is a cycle where the hero returns changed inside and lives in a new normal. So my new normal is that I learned that I could fail in a spectacular fashion and that life goes on. I learned that there are kind strangers in the world like Dex. I learned that Ron would react to this kind of failure with understanding and forgiveness. I learned that I could do this physically difficult thing and it didn't kill me. I learned there was something deeper and stronger in myself than I knew about. Now if you have a drone, I don't recommend crashing it just so you can learn some lessons about yourself. But I do recommend looking for lessons during life's difficult moments. So what's next? Well, I'd taken myself off the film crew. I started working on the Sky Chirping TVOS app. Ron had designed the app layout and created XML templates, and now I needed to write some Swift and JavaScript to make it all work. It took a few months, but we released Sky Chirping to the App Store. When Sky Chirping was first released, we charged $2.99 for the download, and uh, you got a volume of films to watch forever, and we also had a subscription that you could choose to pay for if you wanted to unlock the whole library. We then set out to contact lots of people in the press. And we also contact the App Store promotions team. This was also difficult for me, reaching out to uh, the Apple Press. I would uh, investigate these journalists, um, try to understand their beat, learn about them, find an article that they've written something about something similar to what we had. I wore myself out stalking these people. But nobody replied to my messages. It was. All too much for me. I even resorted to an automated outreach system. Loaded up with some email addresses at HitGo 
didn't really seem right, but it didn't do any good either. We tried advertising, search ads, display ads, nothing did any good. Everything was terrible. But doing this painful work and pleading into the silent email void led me to ask myself some very good questions. Questions we should have been asking months ago, but brushed aside because we were too excited to get to work. Real business 101 stuff, like why would somebody use our app? What problem do we solve for the customer? How big is our target market? How can we track which marketing efforts are working? Uh, the in the paltry data we did have, we did see a high conversion rate from our uh, product page. And so that encouraged us and we kept going. So the, for the first question of why would someone use our product? Well, we liked our videos and we found them relaxing and we wondered if there was something more to it than that. So I found, found myself researching the benefits of nature uh, on humans. And I found a lot of stuff, things like um, exposure to photographs and films of nature, even in short doses, sharpens our recall. Uh, nature deprivation has been linked to large scale public health problems such as obesity, depression, and nearsightedness. The restorative effects of nature can help improve our mental and physical health. So I compiled my research into a big blog post and then we redesigned our messaging and website to reflect this change. The other question about market size and measuring market effectiveness uh, was one big problem we had was that skytripping.com, our website, could not track conversions or drive sales because there is no way to buy a tvOS app in a web browser. So we literally had this animated GIF on our website showing users how to search the app store for skytripping. And that is not good. <laughs> In order to make our films more available to people, track our marketing efforts, and make installation easier, I made my first non-Sprite Kit app. My first commit on this app was on May 3rd, and the app was ready for sale on May 9th. It was a very productive week. There are ups and downs on this path, and this week was definitely an up. We got it into the App Store. Now we could drive sales from our website, and anyone with an iPhone or iPad could install it. The next thing I did was send another email to the App Store promotions team. And I think I'm running long, but I'll put it up there and then you can look at it later. But I, I basically I emphasized the effects of nature on humans. And what happened next will shock you. Actually, when you think of money falling from the sky, you probably think that's a good thing. Remember that $5,000 drone? Ron convinced me to buy? Well, I think you know where this is going. This story isn't a long one, but one of us was flying over a forest in the Rocky Mountain, and the battery was getting low. <laughs> the battery is at 1% when Ron brought it back to the patch of asphalt where we were. The drone was descending. It was about 40, 50 feet off the ground when the air suddenly became silent. The buzzing hive of bees was replaced with tranquility, and its final descent was still and graceful until it smashed into the pavement, breaking the camera and legs. It was shocking to us, and it made us feel a little sick. We were both living near the edge financially, but there was no chance of recovery. This drone was lost. But what struck me most was how quickly we accepted this crash. The copter was lost, it was over, now what? Ron was upset with himself, but he knew that having a woulda, coulda, shoulda attitude would not be productive. We made a conscious effort and explicit effort to accept this crash for what it was and move on. We had no drones. We had made no money. So we couldn't exactly justify buying another one. We decided to instead focus on our assets and our opportunities. We had an app for iOS and Apple TV. We had several hours of content published. We could redouble our marketing efforts, chase down leads, perhaps producing more, oh, sorry. Ah. Spoiler alert. Uh, perhaps um, producing more content was just a red herring. And crashing this drone might have been just what we needed. So we resolved to double down on marketing. We drove down out of the mountains, had a nice dinner, and planned our next moves. A couple weeks later, out of the blue, I got this, uh, I received this screenshot from Ron. Um, this one. Just as, just as unexpectedly as crashing a drone, Sky Tripping was featured on the iOS and Apple TV app stores. Right at the top of the new apps we love category. I guess that email message I sent got noticed. Seeing my app 
on the front of the page of the App Store was absolutely unreal. We had about $5,000 of sales in a few days, and that was almost enough to break even. We saw articles from iLounge, Tools and Toys, D the Daily App, and even the LA Times. It was a very, very fun week. Day by day, we moved down that list until we fell off the end. We were encouraged by the income and the positive feedback. So in November, we set out to capture more footage. Now, there are a lot of expenses associated with generating new content besides cra drone crashes. Um, you have to get somewhere, flying maybe, rent a car, Airbnbs, and usually the Airbnbs and motels aren't where you want to be because you want to be filming in the middle of nowhere. So Ron built a cabinet in the back of his truck and put a mattress on top under the shell. We call it the adventure truck. We couldn't yet justify another $5,000 drone, so we bought a used Phantom 3 Professional for about 750 bucks. We traveled around uh, the Four Corners area and filmed. We, um, how many of you have a business partner out there? How many of you have shared a bed with your business partner? All right, wow, well, more hands than I expected. I can tell you that for me, this was not a comfortable situation, but I adapted. So we traveled around and shot for five days. One morning, the wind started blowing hard mid-flight, and bringing back the bird just sapped all the pow power from the battery. Ron was flying it towards me, about 20 feet off the ground, and I was running towards it, hoping to reach it so I could give it a safe landing. I didn't reach it. It fell at like 100 feet in front of me. We had planned to spend a few more days on the road, but this ended our trip early. We'd gotten some good footage before the crash, but once again, we had zero drones, so we had no choice but to return to the hard work of selling. Oh, that was supposed to be all right. So, now that we weren't featured in the App Store, our sales numbers were dropping off very quickly. Uh, we tried to find ways to ride the wave of the App Store had given us, but nothing seemed to work. In December, we decided that something needed to be done. We decided to make the app a free download and only have the subscription be our income. And it worked. <laughs> Something we did actually worked. Our download numbers went way up and more people tried sky tripping and became subscribers. This was good and you can see that in the summer 2017 the growth plateaued. We needed something more. Uh, in the spring of that year, I applied for a WW, we both applied for a WWDC ticket, and we ended up winning one. So last year, I used the dub dub ticket and got Ron a ticket to AltConf. Uh, after forking out all that dough for a WWDC ticket, we couldn't exactly afford expensive San Jose hotel rooms and the food, and so what are two scrappy app developers to do? Adventure truck to the rescue. We camped in San Jose. <laughs> in Cupertino. We camped in church parking lots. Ron cooks up a mean breakfast burrito for any meal of the day, and we roughed it out here in Silicon Valley. It was exhausting, but good. Ron attended a talk at AltConf last year by Stuart Hall that inspired us to add a new feature to sky tripping called micro meditations. And we really have liked the direction the app has been taking since then. I loved being at WWDC. I liked introducing myself and meeting people. I met people from podcasts that I listen to. I met Apple employees. They say never to meet your heroes, but these, meeting these hero-like people for me was very good because they are people. They're talented, but they're human. I remember debugging some code in a, in a lab with an Apple employee, and it was refreshing because he was doing what I would have been doing. And I realized, hey, you know, he puts his hand, pants on one leg at a time too. And it wasn't like earth shattering. I kind of knew that already, but it was a solid lesson. We also learned that camping out here isn't bad and we're doing it again this year. <laughs> as part of the new, we woke up on the beach this morning, it's awesome. Anyway, uh, as part of the new meditation feature, we also increased our subscription price and this has led to higher revenues. Attending AltConf and WWDC was good for our business and good for us. And we're near the end, but I promised four drone crash stories, so here it is, number four. This story's a little different, my wife and I traveled to Maine just last year to celebrate our anniversary. I brought along a Mavic Pro, awesome little drone, fits in the suitcase, uh, to film the fall colors, and I got into some trouble on a return flight. The drone's battery was low, and it started coming home. But it was overreacting. There was plenty of battery to bring it back, but it was coming whether I liked it or not. 
I was in a forest flying over a huge river, and there was almost nothing but obstacles below this idiotic robot. A bad robot, don't descend. It had a mind of its own, and in my panic state, I didn't quite understand how much control I had. I would descend, and I would push the stick, it would descend, and I'd push the stick up to try to increase the altitude, but it, I would let go and it start descending again. So as a last ditch effort, I pushed the stick forward to try to get it to crash at least onto land instead of onto the water. And you can see, you guys decide, did it go in the water? <laughs> I couldn't tell. I handed the remote to my wife, Jamie, and I took off running into the woods. It was like I was suddenly Jason Bourne or something. I was running, hurtling fallen trees and rocks. I might have cuts on my hands or legs, but I wouldn't know it. Jamie might be wondering or worrying about me, but it didn't seem to matter. Who was this determined guy? I guess it was me. After several minutes, I got tired and went back and found Jamie. And I reviewed the last seconds of the footage, and I started narrowing down where it might be. I really did think it was in the water, but it wasn't. It was just hanging out by the trunk of a tree. <laughs> One of the props was damaged, but in all other ways, it was completely fine. So this was a drone crash, but for the first time, it wasn't a total loss. Now, I've told my, grown, uh, my, grown, my drone crash stories, and I've told you my three bucket list achievements. Now, I want to end by talking a little bit more about success. This is the iceberg's illusion. It's common to think of these things down here under the iceberg as bad. Things like resistance, failure, sacrifice, disappointment, discipline, hard work, dedication. But I've been living down here for the last two and a half years, and it's been great. Of course, I don't want to be underwater. I'm swimming hard to get my head above the water but I've gotten a lot stronger down here. I hope to achieve my goal of earning enough income for my family. And when I do, I expect to set some new goals to strive for. J. Paul Getty's formula for success is rise early, work hard, strike oil. I love this one because there's an almost brutal amount of honesty in it. You have control over steps one and two, but step three is totally not up to you. I've compressed the highest highs and the lowest lows of these, uh, of these two, last two and a half years into these 45 minutes, but there were long stretches of, you know, whole hum days of just getting work done, routine software updates and customer support. We struck oil once, by getting featured on the App Store. And since then, we've been repeating steps one and two, hoping to strike oil again. All told, the last two and a half years of my life have been excellent. I've never been poorer in income, but I feel richer than ever in skills, opportunity, and confidence. If you are on the fence about starting something, starting something scary, I say do it. If what you try doesn't work, try it again, or try something else. You can learn, you can grow, you can adapt. You can because you're human, and you are amazing. Thank you. Should I say something about the t-shirts? Oh, OK. Uh, we have some t-shirts. We brought some t-shirts. If you want one, just like this, find us, ask. We have women's sizes, men's sizes. We'll be in the back. All right, we'll be in the back. Or the front. Yeah, or the front. <laughs> we'll be up here, yeah. Please come up, talk to us, ask us questions. We'd love it. Oh, except that.